My name is Tom Lanny. Welcome to Ream Library. I'm the director of the McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture here at the college. Uh, the McFarland Center offer, organizes lectures, conferences, and other programs that support the college's mission to foster dialogue on questions of meaning, morality, and mutual obligation. You can learn more about our upcoming events, programs, or watch past lectures like this one. You can go back and tell your friends what they missed. They can watch it online. It won't be as good online as you get it in person. Uh, but that's at holycross.edu slash McFarland Center. Today's talk is one of the Deitchman family lectures on religion and modernity, uh, made possible through the generosity of John Deitchman and his family, uh, for whom, to whom I'm, I'm always grateful. We're pleased today to present a talk that coincides and helps commemorate the college's 175th anniversary. Today, we take a look at history, art, and meanings behind our namesake, the Holy Cross. I'm grateful to introduce our guest lecturer, Robin Jensen, who is the Patrick O'Brien Professor of Theology at the University of Notre Dame. Trained in both the history of art and the history of Christian doctrine and liturgy, Professor Jensen explores the intersections of Christian theology, liturgical practice, and material and visual culture. Before arriving at Notre Dame, she taught at Vanderbilt and Andover Newton Theological School in Boston College. Her latest book, which she'll talk about today, is The Cross, History, Art, and Controversy, published by Harvard last year. It spans a 2,000-year evolution of the cross as an idea, symbol, and artifact. Professor Jensen also authored Christianity in Roman Africa, the development of its practices and beliefs, with her husband, Jay Patu Burns, who is here with us today in the back, back, left, back my right, your left. Uh, baptismal imagery in early Christianity, face-to-face -face understanding the divine in early Christian art, and understanding early Christian art, a text for students in both religion and art history. She also co-edited with Mark Ellison the Rutledge Handbook of Early Christian Art, which was published earlier this year. Professor Jensen has served as president of the North American Patristic Society and the Society for the Arts in Visual and, Reli and Religious Studies. Currently, she's vice president of the International Catacomb Society, even. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Robin Jensen. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. It's really an honor to be here on this auspicious occasion, speaking about the cross at Holy Cross. <laughs> and we're not, as you know, I, many of you, I'm sure, not too far off the feast of the Holy Cross, which I will tell you a secret is also my birthday. <laughs> so this is, a, and I didn't really think about this when I began the book, but it became part of my, my narrative. Um, I will, kind of a combination of lecture and a slideshow here, so let me take off. An, an image of Christ, and this one will look familiar, something like this, I suppose. An image of Christ crucified and dying is so ubiquitous in Christian art, it seems impossible that it was not always so. Yet, art historians have been unable to identify an explicitly Christian crucifix prior to the 4th or even the 5th century, and then only a few rare examples before the 6th century. Perhaps surprisingly, even a plain Christian cross symbol is virtually missing in Christian art much before the middle of the 4th century. This is the case even though artists for at least a century before that had created depictions of Jesus performing all manner of other deeds, healing the sick, raising the dead, changing water to wine, multiplying loaves and fish, and receiving the gifts of the Magi. This missing cross has led some scholars to suggest that Christians of the first three centuries were not as focused on the manner purpose or meaning of the events on Golgotha as they eventually became. In place of Christ's suffering and death, these scholars have argued that early Christians emphasized Christ's message of love and justice and a promised paradise. In this view, although Jesus' crucifixion undoubtedly did take place, it was not a central element of the divine plan. Some even attribute the cross or the crucifix's eventual emergence to the first Christian Roman emperor, Constantine, who, they argue, adopted it for political and propagandistic purposes. 
Rather than choosing an instrument of violence or a symbol of human brutality to represent the faith, these same scholars argue early Christians preferred figures of the shepherd or fish or a dove or with an olive branch here because they conveyed the original Christian values of compassion, community, and peace. My aim this evening is not to argue about what should have been, but rather to propose what I believe actually happened. As a historian who works both in early Christian texts and material culture, I cannot avoid the evidence that ancient Christians, Christian writers, in fact, regarded the cross and Christ's crucifixion as a core event in salvation history. It was not just an unfortunate moment that was better left suppressed. The Passion narratives are core to the four canonical Gospels, and at the beginning of the book of Acts, Peter recounts Christ's crucifixion to the Jerusalem assembly. Paul's letters, which most New Testament scholars regard as the earliest writings we possess, offer unambiguous testimony to the centrality of the crucifixion and even the cross, which is sometimes a different thing, in nascent Christian theology. So I bring you uh, there some of Paul's words, so we can just kind of review that. Um, I, I, I will say that this image here from a medieval manuscript, a 13th century manuscript, is, took me a little while to find, but I love it because... Paul is preaching. It's the opening passage to the Galatians, um, the epistle to the Galatians, and it's Paul preaching, and Jesus is jumping out of the book on his cross to the listener. And he says, um, I'm sorry, this is Philippians. I'm sorry, this one is Philippians down below. But in the Galatians, may I never boast of anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. And then, and then this one is, goes with the image here, that the P here is obviously for Philippians. Taking the form of a slave and being found in human likeness and in human form, Christ humbled, humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Um, we could look at these texts as well, and we may not need to spend a lot of time re rehearsing the New Testament uh, documents here. But I want you to notice one of the lines here that's very important, we proclaim Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews and a foolishness to Gentiles, something I'm sure you're all familiar with. And finally, even the idea of the cross, which moves from being the instrument of execution to an image of its own terms. It has its own meaning. Um, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Or even this line in Luke, um, which has its parallels in the other... Um, the other synoptic gospels, who does not follow, who does not, whoever does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. So we have a movement of something that took, uh, an object that took, uh, a, was in, 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 in plot, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm trying to say, in the event of crucifixion now becomes even a symbol on its own terms. Thus before long, Christian teachers began to identify prophetic witnesses to the cross in Old Testament figures like Moses' staff or Isaac's wood or Elijah's axe. They insisted, many of them, that the shape of the cross could be perceived everywhere in the world, in anchors, in ships' masts, in plows, and even in the human form itself. So this is a little quotation from uh, an early Christian father, Justin Martyr, in one of a uh, very similar t uh, passage in other writers, but this one I just chose. The cross is visible in a ship's mast, for the sea is not traversed except that trophy uh, within it is called a sail and should abide in the ship. The earth is not plowed without the cross. Diggers and mechanics do not work except with tools that have the shape of the cross and so forth. So even the human form at, at prayer is the shape of the cross. So when we see these images of fish and anchors, I think we might want to think of the cross. Um, here is a plow on an early Christian tombstone, or a, I'm sorry, it's probably a digger of some sort. And here, um, very often, we'll see ships, let's say, with sails and masts and so forth with this. Um, so those who are perceptive enough to recognize these cross signs 
would realize then that they were proof of the truth of the Christian message, a message that was inescapably grounded in the story of Christ's crucifixion and his cross. But Jesus' crucifixion was difficult to understand and almost inexplicable to those who thought such a death was unintelligible or blasphemous for a divine or messianic figure. Justification and explanations comprised many second century theological deliberations and debates. Ignatius of Antioch, around 100, told the church in Ephesus that he was dedicated to the cross, which, although an offense to unbelievers, meant salvation and life to Christ's followers. Justin Martyr realized that Jews and pagans alike accused Christians of worshiping a wretched criminal, and so he cited scriptural prophecies to Jews and parallels to greco roman gods to pagans. Origen of Alexandria, around the year 200, denied an accusation that Christians worshipped anyone who died by crucifixion. And the African Minucius Felix repudiated the rumor that Christians worshipped wooden crosses. So by 200, there had to be something that people are noticing. Now, I could go on, but for the moment, trust me, we have extensive evidence that early Christians went about explaining, defending, and even proclaiming the crucifixion. We even have some textual evidence that Romans believed Christians worshipped actual crosses. Despite this, only a handful of unmistakable Christian crosses survive in the material record from the first three and a half centuries. These rare examples include handwritten figures like this one called a starogram, which is actually a, a, a tau row, not a kind of a cross, on Egyptian papyri, and some ambiguous marks that might or might not be crosses on Jewish burial boxes, and a few gems of contested date that uh, might be third century. Some people want to make them second. I'm not convinced, but I think I could go with third or fourth. None, however, occur among the abundant inventory of early Christian catacomb paintings or early Christian sarcophagus reliefs or in any known arch architectural context, for example, a church. Even more rare are, are images of crucifixion of Christ or anyone else. A handful of exceptional and difficult-to-date gems, like this one, or one or two graffiti, like this including this was probably a parody made by a pagan to mock Christians who were supposed to worship their god on a cross with a donkey's head. Um, these were discovered with, this one was discovered with the, in the, uh, with the Palatine Palace of the hill. So we have a few of these, and this is actually a very interesting one because it certainly probably is Christ on the cross. It, I would date it to the fourth century. It has been dated earlier. Um, my good friend Jeffrey Spear would date it to the third century. It says ichthus above it, so that's actually the Greek uh, word for fish, which you may know as the acrostic for the titles of Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. So it hints at a Christian association. There are 12 little, um, somewhat alien-looking little figures down here. They sort of look like they're creatures from some s spaceship. But um, standing so could be the apostles. Of course, that doesn't follow the gospel story of the apostles beneath Jesus on the cross, uh, if that is Jesus, and he's bearded, which is unusual, and he's also naked, so it's a very unusual object, very rare. Then, suddenly, almost suddenly, in the middle of the fourth century, an unambiguous Christian cross begins to appear much more frequently. First, as a gem-studded object without any corpus, as you see here. So this is actually not a cross on which any body could be hung. This is a jammed cross, which is Jesus' scepter, but it's Jesus holding it. And he's standing between Peter and Paul. He's, uh, it's an image often called the giving of the law, to, uh, in this case to Peter, sometimes to Paul. But in any case, Jesus is um, already ascended because he's standing on the rock of paradise. As you can sort of see these little, I think I have a button here. Um, you can see some little kind of trickly water springing out of those rocks. It's all drilled with little drill holes. 
Um, so this almost suddenly appears in the middle of the fourth century. And then we have this. Um, this is a Christogram, which is made up of the first two letters of the title Christos, Christ. In Christian iconography, this is often surrounded by a wreath and often tied with ribbons with birds associated with it. And this is a wall painting in what may have been a, ch a Christian house church in Kent in England. Without question, this particular symbol was initially associated with the Emperor Constantine. It reportedly appeared to him, I'm sure some of you know this story, in a dream or a waking vision, depending on the varying accounts, just before his decisive victory over his opponent, Maxentius, at the Rome's Milvian Bridge. That victory seems to have prompted the emperor's conversion to and patronage of the Christian faith. Whether we judge this conversion to be genuine or opportunistic, both the Christogram and the simple cross do now start to appear in a variety of contexts that were clearly imperial and specifically military in character. And so um, this is actually Constantine seeing the cross on the heavens. He's told in a dream to put this on the helmets of, the, of his soldiers and their shields. But what actually is described then is not, interestingly enough, not the cross, but that Christogram, that Cairo symbol. And that is what we see over and over again on the coinage of Constantine and his sons and the emperors that sort of followed them. And generally, you will see this within a military context. So it will appear on a standard, a military standard, or somebody's helmet or somebody's shield. But it is um, troubling to me because I don't think it's actually a cross. So yes, it's Constantinian, but it, something interesting happens with this. Um, so we have um, almost simultaneously with this, oh, I'm sorry, and this is actually according to Eusebius, Constantine's biographer, um, he actually set up a statue of himself holding a cross in Rome. This is the emperor holding a cross, not Jesus now. And uh, this was found in the, uh, the um, Mecca, the Diocletian baths in Rome and is now set up in the porch of the Lateran Basilica. No cross, but you have to sort of imagine one there. According to Constantine's official biographer, Eusebius, the first monumental cross adorned the entrance to the emperor's palace in his new capital at Constantinople. Described as a large, gilded, and gem-studded image, Constantine is said to have regarded it as his personal insignia, protective insignia. And then, of course, Eusebius also describes this. Now, but about the same time, the cross also begins to appear as Christ's staff or scepter, rather than the emperor's. And as here, like the one in Constantine's palace, it is embellished with gems. You can sort of make the little gems out on that thing. So this is not an attribute, not an instrument of execution, but an attribute of a divine and not mortal ruler. Almost simultaneously, Christian iconography began to, began to now to include some episodes from the story of Jesus' passion. Oh, I'm sorry, this is another example of the same thing, so I'm just going to give you some more evidence for this. Now, this is what we're going to next. While the cross appears here in this composition within a narrative, maybe our earliest narrative of passion stories, um, it's in the center, and I want you to look over to the left. You see this cross that Simon of Cyrene is carrying. Jesus is being crowned here, not with thorns, but with an oak wreath, which is the image of a victor. And over on the right are two niches that show Jesus before Pilate. Um, and so we have allusions to the passion story, but of course, no crucifixion. Instead, what is in the center of this image is that Cairo, that Christogram that, we that Constantine has to be linked to, but is no longer, I don't think, imperial. I think now we have the Christogram set upon an empty cross, wreathed, and over two kneeling or sleepy Roman soldiers. And what I'm trying to suggest here is that this has been transformed into an image of victory. 
but not imperial victory. In fact, either Jesus' victory on the cross over death or because this is somebody's coffin, the person who's buried within it. An interesting kind of poly, polymorphous or many, many polysemic sort of image. It could mean many, many things. Um, okay. In any case, within a few years of its first appearance as an imperial logo, the Christogram now gains new meaning. It is the unconquered cross, the Cruce Invicta of Christ, rather than an imperial military emblem. Yet, and if it hadn't had the association with Constantine's victory, it wouldn't necessarily carry the meaning of victory. So it's a way that images transform themselves. This Christogram now symbolizes Christ's victory over supernatural enemies and his resurrection from death instead of an emperor's personal triumph. By association, the symbol indicates the hopes or expectations of the one whose tomb displays it. And this begins to come into even the most simple, ordinary, every the middle class Roman funerary epitaphs. You can kind of make the dove with the olive branch and the summons tomb or summons buried here is named Vicentia or Vincentia. And there's a little Christogram next to that basket. Very modest, very un unassuming, and over here as well. Not even a name, just very simple. This is actually another sarcophagus, but here we don't see any images of the Passion, but we see uh, the apostles proce uh, pro processing with crowns to venerate the cross, which is surmounted by this Christogram. And here we have actually a couple of wonderful mosaic tomb covers from North Africa. Very simple, really, with probably the Christogram at the head of the body that was buried under it with the Alpha and Omega. So importantly, here, there are no allusions to Christ's suffering or death. The symbol Symbol, symbol celebrates Christ's triumph, not his sacrifice, not his bodily pain. In fact, his body isn't here on that cross. The dearth of explicit crucifixion iconography continues through the fourth century and is evident in other passion cycles, such as this late fourth century. It's, a, it's an ivory casket. Um, this is the lid, and we see here narrative of, of Christ's arrest um, and trial before Pilate and the Pilate even washing his hands and there's Peter and his rooster. So we have passion narratives, but we don't have any crucifixion. It's as if it leaps right over the crucifixion, even more significantly and somewhat later at the end of the, at the end of the fourth century, the beginning of the fifth century, way high up in this church in Ravenna are a series of small mosaics that have scenes from Christ's life. And on the left-hand wall are scenes from the Passion. But it, I promise you, you move from Simon carrying the cross and leading Jesus to Golgotha to the resurrection. There's no crucifixion. So sort of interesting. Because the very next, this, um, this image shows the empty tomb. And in fact, the next images over are the uh, Jesus appearing to the apostles on the road to Emmaus. So my question remains, if, as I believe, the crucifixion and the cross were so important to early Christians, why was it admitted, omitted from the visual record for so long? Well, one possibility is that while Christians variously defended or explained or proclaimed Jesus' crucifixion, they could have found visual depictions of it profoundly distressing. Pictures are more powerful than words in many cases. Ask any photojournalist that. Or more pragmatically, since few iconographic or artistic precedents for this very scene existed, it may have taken time for artists to develop one. Or we might have lost the ones that existed, if they particularly if they were constructed from some fragile material like wood. Or, 
Perhaps the image of the crucifix presented fundamental theological problems about how to reconcile the two natures of Christ, human and divine. Well, while the event of the Passion could be described in words without problematically conflating human and divine natures of Christ, a visual image could not show them, both the eternal and impassable uh, divinity and the human suffering and death. Unfortunately, this last explanation presumes that the content of presumes the content of much later theological debates, but it also doesn't account for the fact that we have existing depictions of Christ as a teacher or a healer or a miracle worker that would have necessarily also have blurred his two natures. Some early Christians might have worried that crosses or crucifixes were too much like images of the pagan gods and might attract idolatrous veneration. This is suggested perhaps when pagans accuse Christians of worshiping crosses. But in the end, I have to admit, none of these answers feels very satisfying or convincing to me. And the answer isn't obvious. Considering the rich textual assessment of the meaning of the cross and crucifixion, the absence of them both in early Christian iconography still puzzles. So instead of pressing on any longer for an answer, I think it might be more productive to seek reasons for why these images eventually appeared when they did. So, speaking of September 14th, among the relevant factors is another event that involved the Emperor Constantine, or rather his mother, Helena. The identification of the site of the crucifixion in Jerusalem. Coinciding with Constantine's founding of a shrine complex at that place and the discovery, or we say invention, of the relics of the true cross often attributed to the empress or saint Helena. Once the shrine of the Holy Sepulchre and the cult of the cross in Jerusalem were established, visual depictions of crucifixion almost naturally emerged. It seems likely that the various, very earliest depictions of Jesus' death on the cross appeared, perhaps, at that very site. So, actually, this is one of the wonderful stories about this. How did uh, this is obviously not uh, a from life painting? But how would Helena have known? You know, which one was the true cross, and how would she have known where to dig? This is a wonderful question that I can ask my students. Well, she either is told by the Holy Spirit where to dig, or some Jew remembers, or somebody leads her there. There are various versions of the story. But of course, she's going to unearth three crosses and has to figure out which one was the true cross. And so part of the legend is that they bring along a dead body and see if which cross resurrects the dead body. And that's how we identify it. Whatever the case, and maybe this is actually one more scene left. Yeah, and this is, this is actually the uh, plan, we think, more or less, of the, what the Holy Sepulchre looked like, the complex in Constantine's time, the tomb on the left, the basilica on the right with a courtyard dividing them, and the little ch chapel of the Holy Cross is really quite small within that courtyard. So whatever the case, perhaps the oldest surviving and detailed depiction of Jesus' crucifixion appears on one of four ivory panels of a small casket that today is in the British Museum. Um, this is a very blurry photograph because I took it with my cell phone where I wasn't supposed to, but I brought it to you anyway, so don't tell on me. Um, but it, it shows it reconstructed, where normally you see this thing taken apart in, in, a, in a case, and so it's just wonderful to see this thing kind of put together. Um, so here we have the... Um, the four panels as they ordinarily are displayed. It's named for a 19th century owner and so-called Mascal ivory box was probably fabricated in Rome around 420 and meant either as a reliquary, possibly a container for a relic of the two cross, or possibly a, a container for consecrated Eucharistic bread. As a group, the four panels display scenes from Christ's passion, resurrection, and post-resurrection appearances. And as such, they're absolutely amazing and they're completely unique. They're of equal size, about seven and a half by nine centimeters, 
and very highly crafted in a classicizing style by a very skilled artisan. The iconography of all four scenes is unprecedented, each being probably the earliest of its type. The first panel conflates several episodes from Jesus' trial. On the left is Pilate sitting on an elevated throne, turning away to wash his hands. In the center, Jesus carries his cross off to Golgotha, following the direction of a Roman soldier. On the right is a depiction of Peter's denial. He's warming himself at a charcoal fire while a maidservant points at him accusingly. And there's the rooster up in the corner, ready to crow. The next panel juxtaposes Christ's crucifixion with Judas's suicide. On the left, Judas hangs from a tree. His money bag opens on the ground, spilling its contents. And so the bag almost echoes the idea of, I think, a slithering serpent there. Judas's lifeless body provides a dramatic visual counterpart point to Christ's vigorous living body on the cross. The tree which he hangs from arches gracefully over to draw the viewer's eye to the crucified one. Rather than suffering or dead, Christ is portrayed as alive, his arms outstretched and his eyes wide open. His expression is almost stoically detached. The nails through his palms are the only indication of his suspension. His feet are neither bound nor nailed, and although the image implies the possibility of a footrest, he appears to be supporting his own weight on the cross. Above his head is Pilate's plaque in the form of that tabula ansalta, the tablet with the protruding handles with the abbreviated title Rex Jude for Rex Judaeorum. Mary and John stand as witnesses between the figures of Judas and Jesus. On the right is a Roman soldier who appears, who is supposed to, you kind of miss the, the lance here, but he's driving his lance into, the, into Christ's left side. Unlike the, the, the gems that we saw, that one earlier one with the 12 apostles looking like sort of space aliens, this is actually fairly closely follows the biblical narrative. The third panel is the resurrection panel, women arriving at the empty tomb. It's a wonderful scene. It's also the first one we have of this type. And contrary to the biblical description here, Christ's tomb is shown as a small elaborate monument with fluted columns, a decoratively carved double door, and a brick cupola pierced with windows. This probably is some sort of visual reference, if not a, a, a precise depiction, of the actual tomb shrine at the Holy Sepulchre in, in Jerusalem. It's kind of neat because one little relief carving on the upper right on that door shows Christ raising Lazarus from the dead. And the doors themselves are slightly ajar, and you can sort of see if they, inside, you can see the catafalque or the, the tomb where Christ was, the table on Christ was laid. The final scene um, shows one of the post-mortem appearances of Jesus to his four apostles. Of course, this is the scene of the doubting Thomas, the Thomas reaching to put his finger into the wound of Christ's side. Jesus stands on a small platform. His, hands, his, um, his raised left hand makes the gesture of speech or blessing, indicating that he is giving his final teachings to his disciples. In this one, as in the crucifixion panel, he actually has a halo. Now, clearly the, art, the artist who crafted this small ivory object intended to show the full passion cycle, including Christ's be brief reunion with his apostles before the, the ascension. Perhaps less than a decade after this ivory box, and maybe about the same time, a very different depiction of the crucifixion was carved, also in Rome, but on a section of the large central wooden doors of the Basilica of Santa Sabina, one of the smaller of an ensemble of 28 carved scenes that included episodes from both the New and the Old Testament. This, is, this crucifixion was placed in a rather unremarkable spot in the upper left-hand corner, we think, and so thus almost out of the viewer's range of vision. And it's very strange. 
it shows Christ here for the first time between two thieves. The thieves are about half of Jesus' height, and they wear, all wear simple loincloths. Christ here is bearded, which is also unlike the one you just saw, and he has long hair. The three face forward, wide-eyed, and look more like they are praying, or perhaps dancing, than being executed. I mean, I was in Nashville for a long time. That looked to me like a dance in the Crazy Horse Saloon. But in fact, here, no crosses are even visible, nor there, is there any indication of nails or bound wrists. The trio seems to stand on the ground rather than hang. The three gabled brick structure behind them may indicate Jerusalem city walls, but there are no other figures, obviously. No Mary or John appear here. Although these are the only fifth surviving fifth century examples, we should assume that there were others. I'm going to tell you a quick story. One interesting scrap of literary evidence from coming to, from St. Gregory of Tours involves a crucifix located at the Cathedral of St. Just in the city of Narbonne. It was probably constructed also in the middle of the 5th century and seems to have portrayed Jesus wearing only a simple loincloth, perhaps like this, or possibly nude. This caused a scandal and then prompted a miracle. According to the story, a certain priest named Basileus experienced a vision in which a stranger appeared to him to complain. All of you are clothed, but you always see me naked. Come now, quickly, and cover me with a curtain. The stranger returned two more times to repeat his, this demand to the baffled priest, finally hitting him and threatening to kill him if he didn't obey. When he asked his bishop what he should do, the bishop sensibly ordered that he cover the crucifix with a curtain. Then that story of the Narbonne crucifix may partially explain why Jesus is subsequently depicted almost consistently in a purple robe that covers him from shoulders to toes. One of the oldest, a full-page illumination from the Syrian Gospel of Rabula, dating to 586, so now we're into the 6th century, comes from the monastery at St. John at Zaga. It's now in a library at Florence. The page is divided into two parts. The upper section, about two-thirds of the space, depicts Christ's crucifixion. The lower section portrays two different episodes associated with his resurrection, the women meeting the, at the angel at the empty tomb and the two women encountering Jesus on the way to Galilee from Matthew 28. The crucifixion here is depicted in a style that is often described as Eastern or Syrian, possibly because this is a Syrian gospel. Christ is fastened to the cross with nails in his palms and both ankles. His hair and beard are long and dark. His gold halo is banded with blue, and he wears a sleeveless purple tunic with two vertical golden stripes. His eyes are open, and he tilts his head slightly down toward his right shoulder, and his face may be expressing some sorrow or pain. The two crucified thieves, on the other hand, slightly behind Christ, wear knotted skirt-like garments, we call them perizomata, that cover them from their hips to their upper thighs, rather than wearing loincloths. They are bound to their crosses by ropes across their bare chests. Like Christ, they also have nails through their palms and ankles, however. The scene is set against the backdrop of Jerusalem's two hills, Agra and Garab, and on the far left are Jesus' mother and the beloved disciple. Two other figures are evident, one raising a spear um, to Christ's side and is named um, by identified as Longinus, the other raising a sponge on a pole and holding a bucket of sour wine or vinegar in his other hand. At the foot of the cross, three men cast lots for Christ's garments, and a group of women look on from a distance. So it's very scriptural in its uh, composition and attention to detail. Christ's purple robe, however, is not in the scripture at this point. It might allude to the the robe that the soldiers give him for in his mocking, but he's still wearing it. This robe, called a colobium, is present in subsequent crucifixion images, such as the 7th century reliquary, 
from Palestine. You can see it, the crucifixion scene in the center. It's really a wonderful object it's in the Vatican uh, Museum. It has stones from a pilgrim gathering, stones from different parts of the, of the Holy Land. Um, above is the other scenes of places the pilgrim probably visited, including the site of Jesus' baptism. And this is the lid. I show you this because you often don't ever see this image. It goes, it's rarely uh, uh, photographed. And it's actually the lid of this box, and it's a wonderful image of a wooden cross with beams of radiant beams coming out of it, and I think it's also related to transfiguration. Not a long story because of the composition here. But this one is in Santa Maria Antica in Rome. It's a wall painting, a small sh uh, niche painting, and we see here, I'm just pointing out this long purple tunic with the two golden stripes and the names of Longinus and um, you know, so forth, some of the same details that we've seen. And um, also this icon from uh, Sin um, Sinai from St. Catherine's Monastery. So we're into the 8th century now, and we're, but we're still seeing this purple tunic. This is an unusual image because we sometimes think this is the first time we see Jesus with his eyes closed on the cross. Um, and here we see the two streams of water and uh, blood coming from his right side um, and the um, names of the thieves even included. I have this one also. This is in the Museum of, uh, Metropolitan Museum in New York. It's a reliquary with the same crucifixion. It's actually a cross reliquary. It would have had some pieces of the true cross in it. You can sort of see when it's open, it made a space for that. Now, to show you an a, a early um, image where Christ begins to lose that purple tunic, and this is him wearing, this, again, this kind of apron-like long cloth knotted at the center. Um, in later paintings, you'll start to see it having flowing tails flying out into the, into the breeze. But we start to see him nude from the waist up, um, with this kind of cloth. And actually, this is wonderful because we still see him as very vigorously alive on the cross. His eyes are open. His body is robust. Um, even though there's blood streaming from his side and from the, na from the wounds in his hands and his feet, he's looking very um, stoic. And there's, the cross itself is covered with stars it's a, or a floral pattern, but I think those are stars. Um, and this begins what's happened. So he begins by the 9th or 10th century to lose this purple robe and begin to wear the knotted apron. Um, and we also, which is also, I should just mention, is understood to be Mary's veil. Um, according to the tradition, we see this in Suda Bonaventure, that she looked upon her son nude on the cross and she gave him her veil to wear. But it's also at the same time the 8th, 9th century, that we start to see Christ showing evidence of physical anguish or suffering, and Mary and the beloved disciple beginning to express signs of grief. And here are a few more examples of that. The very famous painting, Nassisi. And we'll sort of end with this one for the moment. So, while these compositions were emerging and evolving, an entirely different kind of crucifixion scene decorated small metal, glass, clay, or vials that were carried away by pilgrims to the Holy Land. Many contained oil that had been poured over a fragment of the true cross. Pilgrims brought these small souvenirs home and gave them as gifts. Although some scenes depict, um, some depict scenes associated with other places, most of them show us scenes from, uh, probably from Jerusalem, from the Holy Sepulcher of the cross. And here we see, again, the cross. But what I'm pointing out to you here is that as these things develop, we don't see the image of Christ's body on the cross still. We see his head is a bust floating above it. Um, and in fact, Below the cross are two pilgrims probably venerating the cross itself. So it's conflating a pilgrimage activity with the, actually the place they were visiting. And lower uh, below is the scene of the empty tomb. I hope this is clear enough. But here's a close-up of that single image of the two thieves 
bodies on crosses, tied on crosses, but Christ is not. Christ is a bust hovering over the cross. Um, It seems possible to me that this iconography reproduces an image that appeared somewhere else in Constantine's Basilica of the Holy Sepulchre. Perhaps the first monumental example of a crucifixion image, if it was in the fourth century. We have no way of knowing because the image is long lost and no surviving documents describe it. However, a bit of evidence suggests that the Emperor Theodosius I presented a gold and gem studded cross to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in exchange for some of St. Stephen's relics. It might have looked like the gem cross that Constantine supposedly affixed to the ceiling of his palace in Constantinople, or the cross scepter that Jesus holds in those early depictions. The presence of such a cross in Jerusalem by the late 4th century could explain the sudden appearance of multiple jeweled crosses in mosaic panels in churches in Rome and Ravenna and other imperial cities. And here's some, here's some examples of that. Um, this is in Rome. It's a f- fabulous mosaic, and I could talk all afternoon about this, but you can, mostly what I'm bringing to show you is that by 400, we're already seeing something which is a cross that's covered with gems, it's gold, it's not the old rugged cross of the hymn, right? It's really tremendous. And this then appears also elsewhere, and this is another wonderful example of it in a city that's uh, right near Ravenna, Santa Apollinaire in Classe, uh, dated to around 540. Now, um, a 7th century, oh, this is another one to show you, this is actually a wonderful... um, reliquary because it had a piece of the true cross in the center here. And we even see this gemmed cross on uh, textiles, curtains, um, all kinds of other sorts of implements. So this is um, a real motif emerging. A 7th century Roman mosaic inserted into a church initially built to resemble the rotunda or to at least recall it in some way at the rotunda of the Holy Sepulchre, makes me wonder. Like the pilgrim's ampullae, here Christ's bust hovers over a gemmed and golden cross, perhaps like the one in Jerusalem. While gemmed crosses, I think, clearly point to Christ's glorious victory rather than his humiliating death, one last type of cross alludes to the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. Tree of Life crosses reflect an ancient Christian tradition that links the two trees of paradise with Jesus' cross. One of these trees was the source of life. The other was implicated in the sin that brought death into the world. According to hymns and legends that date from the 4th century through the Middle Ages, the wood of the cross takes its origin from that Edenic tree and so brings the story of salvation full circle. Christ is the new Adam, and the cross is the new tree, the primordial gift of life and the basis for the renewal of creation. So here are a couple of examples where we start to see the cross associated even by itself to a palm tree with, um, or palms. And finally, this one, and this, I could show you a hundred of these, but this is where I want to end today. Um, This is the mosaic apse, which is dated to the 1130s and um, in Rome, San Clemente. I'm sure many of you may be familiar with it. And it's a really beautiful image that merges the crucifixion, I think, with the tree of life scene. And here's the detail from the base of the cross with the doves riding down it. The growth, the the wonderful um, acanthus springing from the base of the cross and bringing life. Um, deer coming to streams below to drink at it. Um, And here we have that little bit of text, which is kind of somewhat problematic, I suppose, for us these days. But the the text that's uh, inscribed over it is, we will liken the church of Christ to this vine, which the law makes wither, but the cross makes verdant. And to end with this text of um, Venezia's Fortunatus from the Pange Lingua, he wrote, Cross so faithful, tree of all trees, glorious, having no peer, such a tree no forest brought forth, 
with such blossom and leaf and bud, sweet the wood with which sweet nails its sweet burden undergoes. Bend your branches, trees so leafy, lofty, sorry, loose your tight knit inner core, let that stiffness grow more supple which your native birth imposed, that you may stretch forth the limbs of heaven's king from gentle trunk. So last lines are two. The virtual absence of cross and crucifixion images in the first four or five centuries may strike us as puzzling, considering their centrality in early Christian art. Explanations for their absence run the gamut from a proposal that Christians didn't regard Jesus' death as essentially salvific to a lingering shame about the manner of that death to concerns about publicly displaying an image that would outsiders would disrespect or misunderstand. Yet those images eventually emerged, and as they did, they reflected and shaped the theological discourse, the popular devotion, the ritual practices, and the visionary experiences of their day. The empty cross came first, frequently joined with the Christogram as a symbol of victory. Although initially associated with an emperor's military victory, it soon came to signify the believer's hope in the final resurrection from death. The first surviving crucifixion scenes were significantly different in appearance, material, and form from what we know or we're so familiar with that it is difficult for us to say what it meant to those who made or saw them. By the 6th century, crucifixion scenes began to be more consistent in the ways they depicted the events on Golgotha, but these began to be in turn replaced by other types, shifting from an emphasis on Christ's glorious victory over death to his participation in human suffering. Meanwhile, glorious jammed crosses as well as verdant tree of life figures enriched the repertoire and in distinctive ways expanded the possibilities and potentialities of the Holy Cross as a rich and incredibly complicated Christian symbol. Thank you. When we start, to, we start to see some suffering, you know, you can sort of start to see it in the 9th and 10th century, but when it really comes full-blown, I think I really do associate it to uh, Francis, the Franciscan devotions. The Cistercians do start it with Bernard of Clairvaux. You do have um, this attention and Anselm, and you sort of see that emerging. But when you finally realize that the, the whole stigmata, the whole tradition of the suffering, and, 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 a, de and Julian of, a, a Julian of... Um, of <laughs> Why am I blank? Um, her visions um, of the cross. I think the visionary literature, the monastic mendicant literature is really important in the West for that development. Absolutely, yeah. Throughout the history, and even still, we have debates about whether you, know, you should show Christ even dead on the cross, right? So you know, are we, how do we think about this? Can the, God, can the divine being suffer? And this is really complicated. It might even also be somewhat implicated in why Protestants will often say they don't have a body on the cross. Um, so one of my points is that that Christological controversy emerges, um, the theological arguments there emerge after the first images of crucifixion sort of do. But if you are worried about showing Jesus at all, as both human and divine, it isn't only in his death that he's human and divine, right? So he's in his, his whole life and his conception and his birth. And so I don't know if, if it works to think too much about Christology with this. I will say that in the famous, right about the time of the great schism, Cardinal Humbert went to the East and he saw Orthodox or Eastern paintings of Christ that he saw as dead on the cross, and he was outraged. We don't do that, he said. In the world. Well, you were doing it. I, think, I can tell you there were a lot of them by that time. So there is some interesting uh, possibilities there in terms of thinking about how you actually would show this depiction. And I do think the image of the victorious Christ is, is certainly follows and, and tracks not so much Christological discussions as uh, discussions about salvation and atonement. I mean, what is happening? What's the theology of the of the crucifixion? So that's easier for me to, to, to follow, of all things, yeah. Well, we don't know how many crucifixions happened um, later. The, according to a 5th century historian, 
Constantine outlawed crucifixion early in the fourth century. And, he, and according to this story, he did it because he was so devoted to Jesus and it, didn't, it was too sacred and holy a thing to show. So there's some possibility of that. Um, it's what's really interesting is that we seem to have an idea that a lot of martyrs were crucified, but in fact, there really aren't very many instances of martyrs being crucified, with the exception, of course, of Peter <laughs> and maybe Andrew. Um, so I don't know how common it would have been um, in the later, in, in what we would call the late antique period, um, from the third century on. Um, I think it was pretty horrifying. And I think it's reasonable to say that one can talk about something more easily than one can look at it. <laughs> I just think that's a reality. Um, and I, it's, uh, it gives me an image text idea going with that. Um, what can we show that we, we, what can't we show? What do we not want to see? So the, often people want to say, you know, it would be like hanging uh, an electric chair around our necks, right? We want to do that. Um, maybe we're, we've gotten sort of inured to this and we don't think about it anymore. So, yeah. So we take it for granted, but it might have been a lot harder. So there's a wonderful, oh, help me with the date. Um, eight, eighth century, yeah. So, and there's actually tied to some ruins that are on a, 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 an Irish high cross. Well, actually, it's a Scottish high cross. But anyway, um, these um, Irish uh, narrative, um, in, which is wonderful because it's not the first time the cross begins to tell its own story in various places or it begins to have a personification. So the cross, you know, suddenly appears and, um, and speaks. <laughs> and this is one of those great instances um, when the narrator tells the story of looking at the cross and suddenly the cross starts to, he has a vision and the cross has these beautiful gems on it, but, but the gems are also bleeding. Um, and so it's this incredible juxtaposition of glorious jammed cross with bloody, horrifying cross. And then the cross begins to tell the story of the night of crucifixion and what happened. And Jesus is like this young Irish hero who runs and jumps up on the cross, and the cross is kind of his, his partner, you know, his, his, uh, his sidekick in some ways, and they sort of have this, you know, they're, they're sharing their story. And it's really beautiful. It's really, it's also very Irish. <laughs> so um, I think so. Thank you for that. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for your wonderful attention. Thank you.